got to catch up. Uh, when was it? A couple of years ago we did that. That's right. When you came out. You know, That's everything. right. And uh, so we'll bring it up to date. And uh, everything's up to date in Kansas City. There's a lot going on with the stock market. Now uh, I'm expecting you to set us all straight geez. on exactly what's going on. Oh, God. Uh, I Let me know. introduce you, okay? Please. Welcome. Welcome very much to the conversation. A pleasure to welcome to the program Gary Weiss. He's an investigative reporter, has written a great deal on financial uh, matters and the financial system, and he was at Business Week for a long time. And he's written a book. He had written a book. It's out in a year or two now, but I want to show what it looks like. Maybe if you could bring it in. I'll hold it up and you can look what it, uh, what it looks like. It's called Wall Street versus America. And the subtitle of the book that they gave it? Well, it's the, and I quote, mm -hmm. it's a muckraking look at the thieves, fakers, and charlatans who are ripping you off. I see. It's a, it, 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 it's, it, That's it's what a, it says. It's, it, you're singing the praises of the Wall Street gang. That's yeah? for sure. I can see, yeah, the muckraking. That's the paperback edition this just out. This is paper Just edition. out in paperback. Yeah, well, it's been out. Yeah, okay, no, good. Okay, April. good. Yeah, Gary White. And welcome, Gary. It's good to see you again. We did a program a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, welcome. My pleasure, Harold. Okay, now I wonder if you could share with us your own background. That's the way I sort of do things here. You know, background. Born and raised, educated, a little bit of that. And then we'll wade into it discussion about the human condition and the situation as far as economics are concerned mm -hmm. and so forth. Well, I was born in the Bronx mm -hmm. and um, <coughs> on Kingsbridge Road in the Concourse. I don't know if you know that area. I don't it's, know uh, it very well. Oh, it's a lovely area. At least, really? it, at least it was in the old days. Yeah. You know how yeah, it is. Yeah, wide, big, yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> big Boulevard and uh, went to public schools, went to City College. Uh -huh. Up on 130th? Or yeah, that's correct. Yeah, good that's school. That's correct. Not bad. And what um, did you study then? Journalism. 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 Okay. Okay. Good. It's, you know, it was mm -hmm. an easy major at the time. Uh -huh. I don't think they offer it. Oh, they do offer it. They do still offer journalism. Well, what was it? What was the city w situation at home? Was it, uh, was it an encouraging, intellectually encouraging, uh, politically involved, or what? At Not home? too politically involved. No. Okay. no, it was a pretty indifferent environment, I would say. Indifferent. Uh, it was indifferent. Professional we, people. Your dad, mom. My father was an engineer. Okay. And my mother was a was a homemaker. Uh huh. Homemaker. Yeah. We all got along. You know, this was Big family. Small family. Just oh. myself and the. And a sibling, and um, warm, you know, welcoming. A uh, very typical Jewish family. You know. That good. Oh, uh, that uh, that uh. bad. That <laughs> bad. <laughs> you know, yeah. it was uh, quite that awful. Uh. Quite that awful. Uh. And uh, you know, how did you get over toward journalism as a calling? Well, I'd always been interested in journalism since childhood. And you uh, were. Yeah. I mean, Where did that come from? Do you think? Well, I trace it back to uh, when I my readings on World War II and. You know, reading the work of William Shirer, yeah. you know, the great William Shirer. Oh, great. I pulled his book down the other day. I've been mm -hmm. hanging out with some of the 9-11 truth people. Mm -hmm. You know that? They, they, oh, they, yeah. they, they think that the U.S. government was involved in bringing down the trade center. Yeah. All right, anyway, but I went mm -hmm. home, and uh, it's David Ray Griffith, he's a great theologian, and he's a great, impeccable thing. He gave a talk, impeccable credentials and so on. And he gave a talk, and I went home and pulled down William Shire's The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. Mm. And as I read it, and mm. from what he said, uh, the Nazis were involved in burning the Reichstag as mm. a ploy to gain power. And the things that followed afterwards seemed awfully like, to me, the Patriot Act and so forth. Mm. Well, I don't know. Anyway, William well, Shire was great. I remember taking yeah. the whole course on that in university. Oh, William Shire? On the, on the book, on the rise and fall of the Third Reich. Really? You can make a whole course around that, yeah. Well, historians are split somewhat. I know uh -huh. that the academic historians uh, have uh, questions about Shire. And they, you know, they sort of sneer at Shire because he was a journalist and not an academic historian. Popularizer? Yeah, popularizer, and also because he had his biases, you know. Oh. He was... Uh, he lived in the era, and he was, uh, but he was a very involved and committed journalist. He had yeah, an right. opinion, yeah. sort of an early uh, new journalist, you might call new, uh, new journalist as opposed to old. Old would be journalist. What, what characterized new journalist? Would you think? Well, I guess you know a journalist with an opinion, a journalist with a point of view, and is willing to express it, as Shira did in the Third Reich. Why are you thinking that's of being new and old? We didn't well, have we didn't have opinionated journalists in the old days, or well, we did, we yeah. did. I guess it's more an expression of style, you know, new journalism an expression of one's journalistic style. I think, actually, the Berlin Diary, which has always been my favorite, uh -huh. 
to a certain extent written in a new journalistic style. Oh, okay. That's my personal favorite. When Berlin you did Diary. journalism, or you could talk about journalism in that because you're still a journalist in that, but you, you know, you, you have on one hand you got the, the, the charge of what, when, where, how, and high, or you know, the, mm. the facts, ma'am, as Joe Friday would say in terms yeah. of reporting the facts. Then you have this idea of opinionated, and most people are opinionated one way or another or something, but there's this idea about no, none of your own opinion, just report the facts. That's, mm. a, ki that's a part of journalism, then there's opinionated journalism. Distinct difference between the two? Yeah, there is, okay. actually. And you, you characterize opinionated journalism as being more au courant or up to date or something, or m new? Well. We used to, we've always had the editorial page. And that yeah, kind of yeah, I mean, you know, I think if you're fairly representing what's happening in the world, sometimes the only way of doing that is by expressing opinion. You know, if you just mm -hmm. go right down the middle and it's just expressing the facts, and uh, you, the journalist behaves almost as a sort of as a stenographer. Of reality. Of, yeah, of reality or of the perception of reality, then, you know, you're not necessarily There's always doing your job. That. There's a role for that. There is if you're reporting traffic accidents or zoning board meetings or sort of very basic uh -huh. things that are happening. Uh, he said, she said situations. But if you're reporting on complex issues, either political or economic or financial or social, um, just reporting he said, she said doesn't necessarily do justice to You equate to he said, facts. she said with the facts, ma'am? A lot of people yeah. say he said, she said being associated with, uh, you know, uh, 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 well, oh, okay, I needn't go into it, but you understand the distinction and it uh, mm -hmm. seems to me there's a place for for both and there's sure. uh, most of the newspaper that you read and you pick it up is supposedly on that first track to reporting the news. Right. The right. facts, ma'am, as Joe Friday would say, without getting into an opinionation mm -hmm. as to what the reporter thinks. You're not a reporter what the reporter thinks. The reporter just reports right. the news. And sort of like the New York going on. Yeah, sort of like the New York Times in the old days particularly, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. the, the very staid, very neutral, bland reporting. Some people would call that responsible. Well, it Rather is than putting your own opinion into the reporting. You know? Well, sometimes it can read like that, but you are putting your opinion into it, it either. It seems to me it's hard to get away from you it. Know. Yeah. It, can, it can be sometimes. And some things probably are given more to opinionation than others. You know? yeah. Yeah. Okay. Everybody says that the Times in the old days was always very new. Well, there's people who say that now it's a lot different than it was in the old days. And in the 1930s, for example, the Times when it was very neutral, was a much more responsible newspaper than it was today. But on the other hand, um, uh, ma ma many people now are saying that Walter Durante, the, the correspondent in Moscow, mm -hmm. was almost complicit in Stalin's crime by not reporting what was going on uh -huh. in Russia in the 1930s, not reporting the purges. You know, it's not so much you know, that he didn't do a responsible job, even though his reporting may have seemed neutral. There were things that he wasn't reporting. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, um, I think if you go back, I don't want to pick on the Times, but if you go back oh. and you look through the coverage of New York City newspapers as you're just go going back to, say, the, uh, you know, the Gilded Age, you find oh. that there was really only very limited reporting on conditions in the slums. You know, it, the reporting might have read neutral. Oh. In fact, actually didn't read neutrally. Mm. <laughs> in fact, there was some garbage. You'd be amazed at some of the garbage that was printed in even in the New York Times and all New York City newspapers in, in the very old days. Uh -huh. But in fact, uh, they did not report on, on social conditions. Uh -huh. And um, you know, today it's the, you know, you have equivalents of situations today, certain things are just not reported upon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's an off-sited ethic of editorial journalism. Now, I don't know about reporting the news. Mm -hmm. In fact, off-sited ethic of uh, it should, um, Bring comfort to the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Afflict the comfortable. And well, forget about that. It's Nobody does that anymore. It's very carefully observed that uh -huh. that's much more observed in the breach than in the observation. Oh, absolutely. Because most people are, in a certain sense, very interested in singing the praises of those who are rich and powerful and have sure. the influence, right? Well, I just, yeah, I mean, just mm -hmm. to, you know, to relate it to what's going on today, for example, in the uh, in fi in finance, you know, reporting on hedge funds tends to be very much of the afflict the comfortable. Mm -hmm. I should say, I'm sorry, to comfort seems to be very much the comfort, the comfortable, uh -huh. um, and, and, the afflict, the afflicted. and afflict the, the <laughs> afflicted, but not really so much afflict the afflicted, it's to, just the comfort, the, the wealthy and the comfortable. You don't get very if much. If you, you do one, do you know. necessarily do the other? Uh, you mean if you af afflict the, the comfortable? If you comfort the comfortable, uh -huh. are you going to afflict the afflicted almost by um, necessity of the realities of a dialectic structure of the universe? 
in, in a sense, yeah. I guess, I guess you could argue that. But just looking specifically at coverage of hedge funds, yeah. for oh, example, which okay. has been blamed for a lot of the financial morass that we're in right now, okay. the uh, subprime lending uh, crisis. Which, we're, uh, we're, we're recording this on yeah. August 16th of 2007. Right. I walked out of this house today watching the, you know, Bloomberg and the, mm -hmm. the stocks that gone down yet again on 330 yeah, points 300 as points. I left the house. Well, nobody what really. What the hell is going yeah. on? It's gone down a thousand, fifteen hundred points in the last yeah. week or two, or something. There's something yeah. strange going on. Well, not you could understand that because you've been writing on yeah. Wall Street and so forth. And well, maybe you can bring some light to this if you want to go that way. Yeah. I would have asked you, how did you get into writing on things financial right. you were Business Week? But, but if you want to dive right into this, I'll situation. dive right in. Dive nobody right cares. In. Dive how right I into Who, what, yeah. Well, you know what's happening now, of mm -hmm. course, is that. Uh, you know, a lot of very risky instruments, financial instruments, are all of a sudden not as worth, not worth as much as they were a few weeks ago. That's really what it comes down to. These risky financial instruments are tied to mortgages, and that all relates to the pro to the issue of subprime mortgages and how and banks were loaning money to people who couldn't afford to pay back. Basic stuff like all that. All right, uh, define, uh, give a dictionary definition of subprime before the people who are mm -hmm. not in the business. Well, or if you're a tenant like me, you probably wouldn't even understand what a mortgage is. But mm -hmm. you know, if you want to borrow to buy a house and you don't have the greatest of credit rating, right. then you uh, can't get the greatest mortgage. You have to get a subprime mortgage. And uh, subprime, that means that the candidate is rate. subprime in this terms candidate of like, uh, is maybe a great guy, but he's, he doesn't have the greatest credit rating. So he's got to be a higher higher rate of interest, or maybe his mortgage has to be particularly l is uh, is larger and is not eligible for federal federal uh, subsidization programs. And they've been lowering the uh -huh. standards at which they will grant these loans to people for some reason. For years. That, that's called yeah. subprime. Subprime lending. Subprime candidate, in a certain sense, for the credit. Subprime lending is what yeah, they call it. Right. Subprime. And there's been yeah. a tendency in that direction? It's been going on for years. Okay. And in order to reduce their risks, they sell, they sell uh, uh, mortgage obligations th mm. to Wall Street, hedge funds, um, hedge funds uh, you know, uh, speculate in these things. Mm. Uh, investors buy them. Um, they and have a thing called a REIT. They have a REIT. Investment yeah, that's something, something? that's something different. That's something different. Okay, okay. That's a sort of a straightforward investment in property. Uh -huh. This is more of a what you call a derivative. This is where you're investing in mortgages and investments that are tied to mortgages or related to mortgages. It can get very, very complicated. But here's the uh, essential thing. Essentially, it comes down to this. They were worth a lot more a few weeks ago than they are today. And the question comes Same down to... Same thing happened when the mm -hmm. dot-com bubble burst. Didn't right. It? But, uh -huh. but we don't know, and the people <coughs> watching this know what we don't know, mm -hmm. is whether it's going to continue for another week or whether it will snap back, whether there will be a collapse in the next week, which is possible, or there could be a rebound in the next week, because we don't, nobody knows. Could you help me out a little bit here? Because we go, if you look, uh, take, take uh, we had a Gilded Age, we have a, um, the, the way in which the lower classes, uh, economically speaking, the lower and middle classes have been able to, as I understand it, not being very knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. uh, the way that they have been able, because they, they mostly they're working stiffs in a world, uh, and, and the way they've been able to gain uh, a higher net worth mm -hmm. is through the appreciation of the real estate value of their residential properties that they were able to get. That mm -hmm. That's what gave them a chance to have an up, uh, uptick in their net worth, uh, is because that's the one thing they got in on and the real estate. So if there's going to be, a, and that's been a major factor of the growth of the economy and mm -hmm. so forth, you had FHA and all that, but you have that. And if you're going to have a bust in the real estate uh, home market, let's mm -hmm. say something like that, that is going to have a huge effect in terms of people being able to get into the middle or upper middle classes and so forth, and a huge effect upon the economy. It would well, seem to me, and am I wrong, yeah. that that's been the major vehicle by what net worth for the lower classes, not the w old money but the lower classes have been able to realize that, to where they get a house that's worth a yeah. million dollars they bought for 20000 Well, that's, that's certainly been one yeah. of the major ways. I mean, the other is that a lot of people are in the stock market a great deal more now than they were 20 years ago. People have their 401ks. most of the people aren't in the stock market, the masses. Oh, the you'd be s no, in fact, uh, I think the number is, I think, something like 50% of people are in the stock market, if not through a themselves. A quarter inch deep. I mean, there's very little mm. investment in that unless it's through their pension funds. Through their, well, through their pension yeah. funds okay, yeah. or through their 401ks. There's a, gr a great deal more. There's been an explosion in the ways people are invested. 
few mutual funds or 401ks, and I think it's something like 50% of the population have substantial money in the well, stock market. you need market. to quantify substantial. I, I don't see yeah. it that way. I think it's still very, very narrowly held. It, it, but it's and, much and less the, narrowly held than it was years ago. Okay. But also the value of the home, yes, there's no question that if you have a real estate crash, it's going to affect the ability of people, uh, the, the paper net worth of people will decline. Right now you've got a lot of paper millionaires out there living in your city <coughs> who have a co-op that's exploded in price in the next few years. Yeah. But uh, the, you, know, you can't take that to the bank. You can't feed your kids. Well, you could. You could take out a if home equity mortgage board, on yeah. that. But the fact of the matter if is... If the co-op board will let yeah, you. Yeah, if the co-op board will let you is mm, right. Mm. But you can't cash in on that as a practical matter in most instances uh, except by taking out loans and, uh, and, and so forth on that or equity equity loans but on if, you know, if you, the, if you the, cash out and then buy another house and avoid capital gains you're yeah. getting some more money that's the way in which that's one way yeah. in which they because rather than paying rent you're going to buy the house you do it and it goes up in value you buy it for fifty thousand yeah. it's worth three hundred thousand so you've made a gain if you sell it you're you know the, you you're in a little bit on the investment strategy. oh yeah most yeah. people don't invest in the stock market it's a crapshoot well most people don't invest they they, they just sort of plunk their money in there and they don't pay much attention As to it, which, part of which is, by the way, is not a terrible way of, uh, of investing at all. Could I ask you something uh -huh. along these lines? I don't mean to be, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. like we've got a thing called Social Security yeah. that Mr. Roosevelt brought in the year I mm -hmm. was born right. and everything. And he goes, and that, 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 there's a trust fund or something. Are you familiar yeah. with this? Yes. Yeah, now that right, money, yeah. that money, and, the, and the Mr. Bush was coming in, he wanted to try and, uh, you know, deal with the, t with the Social Security long-term feasibility of it and so forth. Mm -hmm. But that money that is in the trust fund has been paid in by uh, w uh, income tax or uh, uh, a tax that was went into that. What happens to that money? I mean, is that is mm. that that doesn't just sit in under a mattress somewhere? It must be in some way invested in part of the market. I know? don't think it's invested in any part of the it's market. Not, it's it held has, in it not even treasury bills or anything of that sort that are so secure. I mean, it would be at the very low end of risk. Yeah. But I it would be. Well, what happens to the money that's in the Social Security trust fund? Uh, in terms of, uh, yeah, that's a lot of money. Yeah. And it would realize a lot of interest, and it would realize a lot of gain, and so. Do you happen to know how that is done and how that's vouchsafed? I don't believe the, the 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 Social Security trust fund is invested in in, in the Where stock is it? market. Uh, not I in the stock market. Yeah, it's, it's not held in the stock bills, market. I believe it's. My understanding is it's held in in in, in sort what? of the equivalent of short term. Uh, tre treasury bills. It's well, held. Well, that's very secure. Yeah, which that's is secure. Totally secure. Yeah, I, or I as think. Secure as the nation. As yeah. I understand the issue with Social Security is, is that it's 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 a question of whether the money that's coming in is sufficient to you know to pay for the money that's going out and whether we're going to have a crisis or whatever. There is some suggestions that Social Security should be privatized. I mean, you know, you have to look at Social Security not so much as a savings account, but almost as sort of as an entitlement, as a welfare program. Well, fact. yeah, but it's been paid into and it's money and it's earning interest and it's got a thing like that. And it's part mm. of, because you have an overall economy that has various uh, investment capabilities, some of them very risky, called mm -hmm. venture, that kind of thing. It goes like that. It seems to me like people want to treat the whole thing as a big venture thing. But most of the, let's just say, the application of human capability to the productive process is pretty sure. Mm. Housing, uh, uh, water projects, all kinds. It's really pretty secure, government bills, that kind of thing. And it's not risky, really, at all. And could they raise the amount of risk that's able to be put into or some sort of a system that would guarantee against loss in order to get greater numbers of people involved in that process of, um, mm. of the, 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 the investment in, in the future that's going to pay for itself out of its future earnings for greater numbers of people other than just distributing everything through wages yeah. or is that well, too there, radical? There's been, there's been some suggestions to have the Social Security Trust Fund uh, invested in the stock market and have people have individual control over their Social Security uh, earnings. You know, there's been all kinds of, of, of recommendations would, related to that. I and you know, it, it's all, you know, you're, you, and anytime you deal with Social Security, Social Security, you're dealing with, with the political hot potato. It's third rail, yeah. And, and Bush learned that. Yeah, and, and yeah. nobody is going to really deal with it. It's going to stay the way, exactly the way it is. It's going to remain a basically <laughs> a social welfare entitlement <coughs> program, which is the way it should be. Well, it was, and Mr. Fro Roosevelt started that, and a lot of people called him a commie for thinking of yeah. doing that sort of thing yeah. back in the days of that. But it's it's a thing. It's it's been a great system. It's been a great. Uh, social security provider for yes, particularly exactly. older people that used to be just wasting away at the end of their life. Sure. They had nothing. It was terrible. 
in the Dust Bowl, that kind of thing. They sure. Have that. But, but now people, younger that, people, though, when they put their money in, the, in Social Security, they really have to question whether they're going to be able to get all that money out. And I think that's what younger people are, people younger, much younger than me, uh, as their money goes in, um, you know, they, they, they doubt whether the money will actually be, be you know, they're going to be getting back what they paid in. And I think that's a serious concern, and I think that has to be addressed. Ever wrote, did you read, e uh, to become a fine, how, well, let's go back a little bit in your mm -hmm. running story of Gary Weiss. And mm -hmm. He became a journalist at uh, college, and then you mm -hmm. went into financial journalism, ended up a, wall, a business week, right. I guess for a couple decades or something, quite a long yeah, time. Yeah, 18 years. How did you get into uh, financial matters in terms mm -hmm. of the specialization, as it were, journalistically? How did you mm -hmm. get to that? And in the process yeah. of that, did you do a lot of economics courses? Did you study mm -hmm. economic theory? Did you get a system of economics? economic theory that mm. informed your ideas and so forth? Not at all. Not, not at, at all. all. Okay. But not how did you all. get into financial matters? Not in the slightest. I have no formal economic trading except a class in economics. How did you get into economic journalism? I was in college, journalism? which I didn't do well in, by the you way. You didn't do well in what? I did not do well in economics. You didn't college. do well in economics? No, 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 no. You want no, me to no, tell no. you something? Yes. You want to tell you? I did a program with a lot of people, so thousands of programs. Mm -hmm. The one I did with Isaac Asimov, mm -hmm. great polymath, right? Wrote on everything, man. He could write a, he could write a book. He wrote. I did a thing. He had written seven, something like eight hundred books or something, or seven hundred books. Mm -hmm. He'd write a book on everything. Mm -hmm. He would write on physics or on astrophysics or art or anything he could write. And there was only one subject that was beyond his ken. And I asked him when I started mm -hmm. the program with him, what had he instead of what had he written on, what had he not written on, because mm -hmm. he'd written on everything. Only one thing that was beyond his ken, he could not fathom it at all, just mm -hmm. from an intellectual thing. It was economics. It he was couldn't economics, understand it. Yeah. And yet it informs everything. Yeah. And it's really very, very important, but you didn't do well in that. I didn't do well in it. But you uh, ended up re reporting on well, matters well, financial. Yeah. I always used to tell Bill Wallman. Uh, yeah, I had Bill Wallman was great. Bill Wallman was a doctor great. of economics. He Absolutely. was my boss at Business Week, and I always huh. used to tell Bill how I did not do well in it. I always used to fling that in his face when you I was would do that, working at Business Week. Him and Seymour Zucker, another doctor. We had two doctors of economics. I didn't know Dice Zucker. Seymour? Didn't know oh, you yeah. should get him on this show. He's a former uh, senior editor. Still around, right? Certainly is. Doctor good. of economics. Please, get no me in longer, touch with him. No longer with Business Week. Retired yeah, okay. now, but he's a good man to talk to. I think some of the best people to talk to are emeritus. Yes. People, you get passed out some from under the pressures of the yes. everyday thing and everything. You can really think about things. But Emeritus. how did you get into things get into financial and not doing uh, well in economics? Well, originally I was, uh, you know, in Washington I was working for a small news service and yeah. I was reporting on regulation. Okay. Um, on the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. This was back in the 1980s. It right. was very hot. Energy regulation. Sure, absolutely. Back in the days of, uh, you know, atomic power was becoming controversial. Dixie Lee Ray. Kind of yeah, that right. kind of thing. So I um, it started to, to report on that in Washington. And then when a new service I worked for went out of business, uh -huh. went bankrupt, what may it rest in peace, mm -hmm. um, I got a job at Barron's Magazine in okay. New York. Barron's was, uh, was expanding its staff. In, in New York. So, so uh, why, why had you gone regulatory, government, business, money, economics, rather than, say, art criticism or something, which is your, I mean, well, how did you get into that realm? I was just interested, really, in, in um, you know, in government, and uh, in, that in was government. just, it was just yeah. sort of where the job was at the oh, time, okay, you know. Okay, that would be a good Quite indicator. frankly, like, I went to work for Barron's, there was a job at Barron's, Barron's Financial. You could have got, you, if they had offered you a job in Antiquities Magazine, you might have become a great uh, study of... Uh, mm, quite possibly, you know, although uh, I didn't really have any experience. You know, you just sort of like wind up sort of stumbling from one spot to another. I think so, yeah. And that's what that. happens. Yeah. So like in, in, in Washington, I wound up writing about regulatory. Right, um, big issue. Because yeah. that's With energy, sort of where yeah. the job was, and okay. that was sort of my interest. Okay. And uh, then I got a job at Barron's in New York, because, uh -huh. you know, that really was, the, they were hiring at the uh -huh. time. And what kind of reporting you know. for Barron's did you do? At Barron's, I was writing about companies. You know, when you talk about financial journalism, you're not really writing about economics. You know, like okay. at Business Week, uh -huh. I didn't write about economics or economic policy. We had economists for who wrote about that. Oh, okay. Know. Mike Mandel, who's somebody you should also talk to, uh, writes books Thanks. on economics. Mike Peter Mandel? Coy yeah. uh, wrote about economics. Uh -huh. um, well, uh, Leonard yeah, Silk. And Leonard uh, Silk prior yeah, to that. Yeah. And, you know, they, they have uh, that kind of stuff. You didn't write about economics. Louis I wrote John about, Schellner. I sort of wrote more about, in, uh, you know, more about, about the way Wall Street works, okay, well, which is not really a matter of economic policy right, per se. Right, I don't right. deal in, in my book, I don't deal with economic policy at right. all. 
I'm not really interested in that. Or you're that. not dealing in economic theory or anything like no. that? No. Yeah. Oh, right. Uh, okay, you're working about pragmatic reality. It's yeah. the reality of how Wall Street works and how it doesn't work. And that's mm -hmm. why getting back, for example, to... to um, mm -hmm. Charlatan? Yeah. Uh, thieves? Well, actually... Uh, mm -hmm. Hey, tricksters. Today it recently Watch came them. out, mm -hmm. you know, when we were talking about hedge funds and about these subprime markets, yeah. we, we recently came up, you know, it all has to do with hedge funds, which are these risky uh, vehicles that invest in all kinds of risky stuff that have a lot of impact on the financial markets. Yeah. Today there was news that there's, a, that there's a possibility of another major hedge fund blow up, Where? such as took place in 1998. Uh, That's what actually Moody's Investor Service, which is this very prestigious research Indeed, firm, yeah. said, and without naming any particular uh, hedge fund, said uh -huh. that we uh, have the, we are in the we have are in danger of there being another hedge fund collapse as took what place in 1998. In 1998, you had a sort of a kind of a similar type of situation. Well, that's where you had a blow up in the uh, in the emerging markets yeah. among Russian bonds and emerging market debt. This caused the blow up of a, of a, of a hedge fund called long-term capital market. That's right. Yeah, which right. practically caused the whole financial system yeah. to collapse. There was a bailout of long-term capital management. So, yeah. Bailout um, by, 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 by the Fed. By the Fed. It was right. sort of a consortium uh -huh. of uh, banks uh -huh. led by the Fed, which bailed out long-term capital management. They didn't do they it. They had to. It was going to be yes. pull the rug under the whole economy, I think. Right? Ex exactly. Too big to fail as a kind Too big to fail. Yeah. Too big to fail. Uh -huh. So we're, we're going through that same situation again, and it's because the government refuses to regulate hedge funds because... <coughs> Could government allows Wall Street to sort of run amok. Okay. Could you spell out a hedge fund when it got started, the term? There was a particular person it's associated yes. with. And yes. Then, you know, yes. maybe you could spell, because it's all in the news now. Everybody yeah. seems to be in a hedge fund or has been. Well, hedge funds are, are totally different than they were when they originated. When they originated, they were these when little partnerships originate? back in like the 1940s and 50s. That long ago? Oh, yeah. Maybe okay. maybe even before then. They Nobody were below really the radar knows. for a long time, wanting yes. to be, right? They were. I, I wrote, started writing about them when they just started emerging from the radar in the mm. late 1980s. Okay. They were these little partnerships. They didn't really do anything all that negative. They so just why simply, did they get the um, name hedge? Uh, hedge because they the were market? hedged. They had. They went long. They bought stocks. They also sold them short, which is called hedging. Mm -hmm. So they were called hedge funds. Nowadays, mm -hmm. hedge funds generally don't hedge. Hedge funds, it's just. It's just another term for a, a, a large investment pool, investment partnership, usually for the very wealthy, which has a lot of money, which does very, uh, can do very risky things. Risky. And, uh, and can do things, for example, like, in, like trading these subprime mortgage securities. Uh -huh. It's not like venture. No, it's something venture. different. Venture is sort of similar. It, it's, it's also a partnership, but those are... Those are the, the, the venture capital partnership invests in, 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 in new in, technologies, in new technologies, growth companies. They they buy private security. Why couldn't <laughs> a hedge fund invest in? And they I can. See that there were some even things they like do. insurance companies invested in hedge funds. Oh yes. I mean, okay, go on. Oh, I'm yes. sorry. Be insurance companies invest in hedge but funds. But venture capital is associated with high risk. I mean, I associate it in my mind. Well, yeah, they, venture they, is risky. It can be risky, but and they're you can not. get a big return. Not, exactly, but a yeah. venture capital fund does not invest in public securities. Mm -hmm. It doesn't affect really the stock market. They okay. invest in private equities. You know, if I'm starting up a, you know, a, a, a seed company, you know, they'll, 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 they'll uh, finance me if mm -hmm. I've got the right to whatever. Mm. Now, that's what a venture capital fund does. Mm -hmm. But a hedge, a fund, hedge fund? A hedge fund, they invest in stocks, bonds, securities, generally in public, not exclusively, but almost entirely in public Securities, stocks, mm -hmm. bonds, things that you and I would buy. They started in the 40s, you say? There weren't the hedge 40s. funds at the turn of the 19th, 20th century? Well, or things uh, comparable to it within it's possible. the market? I mean, they've been trying they, tulips. Well, they did something with tulips or something. The tulip oh, mania. Yeah, that was in the 1600s. Yes, that goes way back. That wasn't the yeah. hedging thing or based upon mania or. That was just somebody, that, no, you know, that was just people buying up tulips. Yeah, but it was a, a... That was a different thing. Okay. That it's was somebody cornered the, the market in tulips. Oh, oh, okay. I think it was. Okay. It was and a tulip mania. And they also hyped them. They hyped the idea that they would go up forever. And yes. Then that's yeah, okay. true. But, but that's, that's, that's not the same kind of Bailey you're talking about with the hedge fund. No. In the no. 40s. What happened in the 40s that caused these things to emerge as opposed to the investment pattern that had characterized the economy? I don't before? know exactly what happened. Okay. It's just that this fellow named Alfred... Um, 
the name escapes me, Alfred Sloan, I think his name of, I forget. Yeah, Alfred Sloan. Uh, was that General was the Motors. head of General Motors, whatever the hell his name yeah. is. This guy, yeah. whose name is in my book, whose name yeah. escapes me. Yeah. Um, this, this guy, Alfred something, yeah. began Alfred P. Newman. Alfred E. Newman. <laughs> Alfred E. Newman. Let's e. call him that Thank just you. for the sake Thank of you. argument. Thank you. got to get these things straight. Alfred E. Newman. Yeah. His name is lost to history. It's yeah. lost to my memory. Not in my memory. But it's a good reason to buy my book because you can... Absolutely, yeah. You can, you can, you can, you'll be able to... His name is in there. Yeah. He just started up... Uh, he just uh, organized a partnership and mm -hmm. he got his friends to invest. Mm -hmm. And he invested their money the way he invested his own money. And that's really all it, all it was. It was sort of a nice, cozy little thing. Warren Buffett. Uh, hedge had a hedge fund in the 50s and 60s. Did he I think build in the up 60s. His things from, his, from hedge funds? Yes, he certainly did. And what gave him the. It's, it, it's not just really good. It's a particular investment strategy, or is it just a particularly skilled person? Like w uh, Tiger Woods is pretty good at playing golf. It's sort of based on the, on yeah. the, on the manager. Uh -huh. You know, and uh, a hedge fund is a partnership, or used to be a partnership, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to a mutual fund, which is not quite the same thing. But, yeah. you know, nowadays all the terminology and all of the assumptions that people made about hedge funds in the old days is all gone. Nowadays, hedge funds are just basically big mutual funds. The difference being is that in order to invest in them, you have to be a millionaire mm -hmm. or, or better. And... Um, uh, and there's they, they a lot invest. of capital sloshing around in the upper levels of our society. Yeah, right? there's tons of it. And, yeah. and, and this is money that they put in very risky investments. And the things that they do with those investments sometimes can be difficult for the market. Um, they'll do things like, for example, one widely publicized incident in the early 1990s is that uh, some hedge funds, along with Salomon Brothers, cornered the market for treasury, two-year treasury notes. Mm -hmm which was a very serious incident in the early 1990s. Somebody it was sort of an early warning sign of the danger of hedge funds. Somebody down in Texas tried to qualify. Is it a silver market? Yes, Bass? exactly. Uh, nah, I forget. I anyway, forget either. Yeah, people have tried that for a long time. Yeah, it's similar. And Mr. Rockefeller with oil, I guess. Or that's a precisely. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's all really the same yeah. sort of thing. Uh -huh. Right now, we're, 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 we're reaching a situation where these hedge funds um, and these hedge funds had invested a great deal in mm -hmm. paper that had to do with the subprime loaning of loans for mortgages to a lot of the folks. Right. They do the same. They tend to make take the same and strategies. And that's coming a cropper, perhaps. It, it is coming a cropper. A lot of them are, are engaged. Like, so there were some, uh, some Bear Stearns funds that had very big losses very recently. They did. And the people whose mm -hmm. properties are involved in those things are going to be ca losing heavily when their mortgages are called and so right. forth. And well, it's, it's really sort of, of the, it's going to hurt a lot of the folks maybe when it, when it comes down. But right? they have to rem remember that it's it, that those are two sort of, they're interrelated, but they don't cause each other. It's not the hedge funds hurting the people owning the houses. Mm -hmm. It's because people are defaulting on their mortgages. It's because yeah. of, the, of the problems within the subprime market that the hedge funds have problems. And then maybe the subprime market shouldn't have ever been there if there was a conservative investment strategy rather than trying to push the margins? Well, it was, it was, serving, it was serving the needs of consumers to, you know, right. to buy houses. Well, we probably, do need to we probably do need to push the ability for the people, by and large, to have credit in order to get into the investment logic of business finance, which is you're able to make an investment that's going to pay for itself out of its future earnings. Yeah. That's what people get. W that's, what, that's the logic of business finance. Is it not? Well, people and it doesn't involve most people. They only get wages in order to live. Yeah. Well, it's it's well, this this crisis developed. That's why because I wanted to begin with that Social Security. Yeah. Well, these crises develop because banks, you know, and, and you know, lenders like Countrywide Lenders, which just uh, which has had some severe problems. Novastar and some other of these companies. You had companies out there loaning money to firms. Uh, loaning money, I should say, to people who really couldn't afford to pay them back, and they well, and the term subprime. and that's yeah. subprime. Uh -huh. well, um, Moody's used to joke, mm -hmm. don't they rate bombs by a, a, B, and so forth? And that's yeah. a very important thing at the rate at which you can advance. I mean, that's the 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 the, the measuring of risk and the ability for the person to meet the obligation of the contract is something important for anybody in business to do. Oh, absolutely. And the swaps and derivatives were involved in that, were they not? Yeah, part in of hedging. That? Trying to hedge risk. Trying to hedge the risk on the part yeah. of the lenders. Uh, right. And if you write a mm. if you write a banking contract and you didn't have some sort of a derivatives clause in there, you could be sued for malpractice almost. Oh, exactly. Yes? Exactly. True? Yes, precisely. So that was really true. Oh, sure. Okay. Sure. But you see, the, so now the issue really is, you know, what do you do? As an investor, there's not very much you can do. Right. You know, it, that's why I, I suggest in the book, and I've always, you know, certainly is something I've practiced as well as 
preached is that investors really need to, you know, if you're going to be in the stock market, which is a separate decision. Yeah. I, if you're going to be in the stock market, you need to be diversified. You need to be in a widely diversified, preferably an index fund. Uh, it minimizes your <coughs> risk, you know, like I, you know, like that's what I do with my own personal money. Most of my money is in index funds. I do have some <coughs> individual stocks, you know, and um, you know, I, I have that also diversified. You know, I have oil stocks. I have some stocks that are real estate related. You know, mm -hmm. I don't write or write about them, God forbid, I won't mention uh, them. What was the last? What was the uh, last? I have tip? some that are real is estate. Is that a tip? Wait a minute, is that a tip? <laughs> Everybody, what? Huh? One of my real estate Inside stocks. Inside information? Yeah, one of my real estate stocks is down 20%. Oh dear, I'm Then sorry. Hand, I have an oil yeah. stock that's up. But these are just like a small portion Why? of my of my total net worth, uh -huh. just 100. You don't have any in treasury bills? Uh, no. You don't have anything as a hedge? That, uh, that's a way to get away from risk. Just cash. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, I have some money in, uh, you know, just I, you know, like could we I get a, a could we get a come? reading from the Social Security people on how that money, where that money is in terms of the national economy? Yeah, you know, I, I don't think that money, if it's invested, is is, is invested in anything. Well, it's not under a mattress somewhere, well, it or it's in not in a passive savings. In effect, it, it might very well be in a mattress, because the government's, as I've always understood, the government's general fund is not invested. It just it's just sitting there. That's well, always been my understanding. The government does not. I can't believe it's just sitting. It's got to be there yeah. in some sort of a, a, a reckoning with because there's going to be yeah. there's all kinds of a paper, a government, a treasury bond, everything. It's mm -hmm. got to be somewhere. And what I'm saying is that might be the very bottom of the most secure possible mm -hmm. thing, apart from the whole world blowing up or something. But then, how far up the risk ladder could they go with social f investing for the people to have them involved in something? that is reasonable instead of treating the whole thing like a great big venture crapshoot. Yeah. Well, you have to keep in if mind. If you understand course. what I'm saying. Yeah, well, you know, you have to remember about the Social Security Trust Fund is that they're not they, you know, they're not like you and me or you know, some guy of 20 just going out of college who can ha who has like a, a long-term a time horizon and who by the way should be in should be in the market. Should have his 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 uh, long-term savings mm. in the stock market. Absolutely. Uh, they're paying out money to people. They have a lot of immediate uh, short-term obligations as well as having to... Yeah, uh, they got a lot of college loans yeah, they have to pay off. Well, I'm, I'm talking now about the Social Security Trust Fund is paying out well, money all the time to retirees. More and more, only three to one, uh, uh, you know, three, three people. It's, uh, their precise they, cash management, frankly, is not something I'm an expert on, but okay. they have to k take into account the fact that the money that they've got money going out, they have money coming in. I just reread, because I'm not a journalist of uh -huh. economics, and I don't understand it and everything, but I just reread some of Mr. Lord Keynes. Uh -huh. Lord Keynes has written a letter to his grandchildren in 1930, mm -hmm. and it's about now. Well, 30 years of generations, mm -hmm. something. And he said, we're going to be confronted with something that is really hard to understand, but we're going to be confronted with uh, technological unemployment. Mm. And we live in a world where all, for the mass of the people, all this money that the people paid into Social Security had been got to them through their labor participation in the productive process mm -hmm. for virtually everyone. The investment class, is, despite what you say, I, I really don't think it really factors except pensions, which is important. But, you know, they, 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 and he said that it's now coming to be where the productive, pro if you take labor, on one side of an equation, you take everything else, intangibles, corporate, all the finance, uh, technology, all patent rights, all that. On the other side, the labor contribution is diminishing through time, and yet we distribute all income and call it legitimate through what they call jobs to the mass of the people is how they're going to get income or val uh, outside of need or just some sort of social distribution of in transfer payments or something. Uh, you know, that they're going to get it by having a job. And his claim was that the technologies are going to undercut the input of labor to production if that's going to be a claim that they have on production because they're contributing to production through this labor theory of value. Mm -hmm. And we're coming, uh, we're coming against that. Mm -hmm. So what are we going to do? How are we going, if that is the case, Lord Keynes is pretty prescient. I mean, that's at an economic theory level. And all economic theory is built upon that theory, whether it's Marxist or, or Friedman. Mm -hmm. I mean, how are we going to distribute income to people if this idea of distributing according to labor is going to be valid in a, in a world? And if we're not going to do it, how, wh why can't we take the level of investment in the overall economy mm -hmm. and let it be? So the one thing that's really secure in this economy is Social Security. It comes mm. every week, every month. It comes right on the spot. It never misses. Right. Never misses. If, you're lo if you secure. live long enough to collect. If you live long enough. Yeah, if you live yeah. long enough to collect. Not but he was saying does. by the time the grandchildren came, yeah. which is now, their, mm. their input is going to be undercut. 
And that's never mentioned by any politician. All they talk about is how can we increase jobs and distribute income to the people through jobs rather than having them own some of the technology that's really responsible for production. That's what yeah. his theme was. That doesn't something you dealt with. Or no, deal I don't with. really deal with any okay. of that. I don't okay. deal with that. I, uh, that's really sort of more a question of macroeconomic theory. Yeah, I'm sort right. of dealing with the way the Wall Street okay. works for people who invest, which is a great deal more than you might expect. Okay, and by the way, one thing is, you have yeah? to keep in mind mm -hmm. uh, is that if you look at the numbers that the Fed has kept on, um, on share ownership in the United States, mm -hmm. there's been a dramatic, going back actually seven years, as of 2000, there was a dramatic increase in, in the number of Americans, just simply the amount of, of shares that's owned by individual Americans, even though institutions continue to dominate yeah. the market, yeah. the amount that's held by individuals has become, you know, really quite quite extraordinary. Can you quantify it in um, out of the top of your head or not? Because I believe it's over 50 percent of Americans own shares through either 401k plan or through, um, well, that's know, a pension. or directly. Yeah. But you know, a 401k plan is, you know, is something that you're going to be, is probably going to be giving you more, is going to be, you know, a more significant source of income in the future for you if you invest it correctly than, than Social Security. Yeah, that's invested. They're investing that. People the pension investing. plan is going to invest it. They're not going to sit there Very and Very few people have pension plans. For hmm. the majority of people nowadays, there's not a question of pension plans. It's a question of 401k plans. It's a difference. 401k plans is, is a almost form a, of investment. It's a deferred I mean, okay. savings account. Okay. And people generally don't invest their 401k plans wisely. Uh, most people invest their 401k plans. Uh, sometimes they don't have any choice. Mm -hmm. uh, companies give them only uh, very poor alternatives, mm -hmm. high fee mutual funds, mm -hmm. uh, non-diversified mutual funds, funds with vague names, mm -hmm. um, high fees. And they need to, you know, and thieves and... You can be eaten up completely no. by fees. Uh -huh. A 1% yeah. or 2% sales charge can totally destroy uh, what you're putting aside for your own future. You that's know, a lot of that stuff that's in the fine print yeah. that nobody gets a chance to read, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for people who are, who are like 20 or 30 years old today, they, 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 the Social Security for them is, is sort of as a non-issue. They would just as soon rather take that money that they're putting into Social Security. I'm not, I can't speak for them, but I'm sure a great many of them, polls well, have shown, they would rather take that money and put it and invest it themselves. Well, I, I would think so. I've it would make sense for them because I think sure. when we got started, you had uh, 20 people working for every one that's getting any benefit in 1935 or 1935. Absolutely. Now it's down to about three or two to sure. one working, and so all that money's being taken out of their earnings and put into a fund to pay for the people that it, 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 it seems untenable. Yeah. And it's a question that can't be addressed politically because Social Security is so vastly popular. That's right. You're not now, the thing is, could you improve upon Social Security as a way of structuring the whole economy is the thing I was getting at, but that never is brought up and that's in yeah. reform it's hard to do because you got the politics and that but we're getting away from things yeah. on my thing and not ones than yours or you're familiar with when you wrote mm. the book what what prompted you to write the book was there any particular thing or well, just a I, series of I've been things? writing about Wall Street for many years right. and, and, and this was sort of a culmination of what I've been um, of, of really a great deal of what I've been researching on over the years, the impact of hedge funds, mm -hmm. uh, the disadvantages of investing in mutual funds, mm -hmm. uh, the problems that are brought uh, by, um, by, by poor regulation, unintelligent regulation, mm -hmm. which impacts anyone with, uh, you know, with any kind of, of money in, in, a, in a share account. Sure, yeah. Uh, the, the interest in hedge funds and away from mutual funds, I mean, that they're they're opposites or something. I mean, well, hedge funds are and, and and mutual funds share certain attributes which are bad for investors. The majority of both hedge funds and mutual funds have well, certainly the majority of hedge funds have prohibitive fees. Now, of course, this is not because it's for the big guy. It's for the it's for the rich. You know, personally, and it's I also, don't doesn't it also have a thing where you're going to make a big return? It's like. You know, you're, yeah, you're, technically, you're not going to be but making your passbook savings. Yeah, but most hedge funds don't don't really give they you. They promise that though. They promise that, but the majority of them, in fact, don't uh, don't actually provide and returns. They're looking for an edge, or they're looking for a hedge. Yes. You're going to hedge your thing. Exactly. You're dealing with that. That's and over it, time, yeah. they don't find it. You know, they that's what all the studies have found. Really, hedge funds over time don't. Find the major problem is presented by hedge funds. You know, I don't really care that they're not a good to invest in because the only yeah. people who invest in them are ultra wealthy people. In fact, I couldn't care less. You got you know, do you, do you, do about you about that. The problem with hedge funds really is more uh, the, the potential difficulties it can cause for the system, the systemic issues, right. which we which we may be seeing right now with these subprime uh, mortgages. 
It's terrible. This yeah. last month or so, it's gone down about 1,300 right. points. And that, I mean, it's like some sort of a, what was it in 87? Mm. We had a big crash and went down 500 points one time yeah. in a couple of days. And everybody day. was in a total panic all over the world. Now it's gone 1,300 points, Gary. That's right. In this, it's like a rolling Well, coaster. on a percentage basis, it's less. What the hell is it? Well, okay. don't forget it was 20%. It was 20% uh, in one day. Uh, in 87. And that's the last, uh, that hasn't happened uh, How since much did 1987. It, uh, okay, so yeah. 20% in one day. Were you shaken up when that happened? You were right on the reporting front line, were It was. You? It yeah. was. Uh, it, it certainly was. But, but you see, you know, the, 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 the problem, the issue, the issue now yeah. is, you know, there, there was no, it, it was just simply a, it was just sort of a calamity in 1980. We, we haven't really seen that mm -hmm. since then. And I think the, the, the issue now relates to, you know, what, what is the role of, of hedge funds and other investment vehicles in causing what is going on right now. And right yeah. now we might be in a situation where in fact, um, perhaps there will be another blow up of a hedge fund. It might, or, or, or it has international implications. Sure, it does. Because everything's interconnected now, increasingly, Certainly. right? Yes, absolutely. So, what is your thought? You're you're pretty mm -hmm. well versed in all of this. What do you think is going to happen? Let let uh, let's give the viewers a, uh, you know, a thirty. They know a great deal. Sixty day days out into the future, of what's going to happen? Well, or they or know year. better than I do. No, really, the, the viewers future. know well, better than Of course than you. they do, because this is going to be aired in one week. Oh, I see. By then, everything will have changed. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> knows. The roller coaster will have gone up and right down. Now, right now, things, mm -hmm. things yeah. look really terrible. So, uh, wherefore, one of two things can it's happen. Gonna be, yeah. You can either have either, either number one, you're going to have a continuation of this market uh, decline, which How is far can and it go? or you're gonna, you're gonna, it can either go up or go down. Okay? Yeah. And nobody knows mm -hmm. right now. And there is no way of predicting what's going to happen. Do you the read the financial press? Or, or no, the popular financial press, like New York Times editor, uh, sure. it, uh, business pages and things like that. Uh -huh, Louis yeah. Vuitton. And well, what or, the financial or Paul Krugman. Yeah, what all the financial media does at all, at all times, including Paul Krugman, is very good, yeah. uh, is to try to speculate as to what's happening. And, and, there, and there is really no way. That's the one thing that makes financial journalism different from all other types of journalism. Wait, wait a minute, everybody. What yeah. makes financial journalism different than all other all journalism? Other yeah. Is that it's inherently predictive mm -hmm. on things that are unpredictable. Mm. It's impossible to predict. Have you seen the Black the Swan book yet, or uh, no. Tab Talib? Do you know Talib? No. He no. just wrote the book. The Black. It was on the best-selling list of un uncertainty in the market. Uh, yes. It was on the best-selling list. It aired mm -hmm. yesterday, or you know. Uh. Uh, my program. Uh, he he wrote a book called uh -huh. Fooled by Randomness. This Fooled by all these Randomness. Yeah. It was, yeah, and he's got a thing that goes on that theme. And he mm -hmm. wrote a book called Black Swan. Uh -huh. And the term generically is something that's uh, uncertainty that appears. Most swans are supposed to be white. Mm -hmm. but he said the First World War with the effects of the Sarajevo 17 guns of August was the biggest black swan ever, or yeah. the internet was. Unexpected things that happen that can't be predicted. Everybody's trying to predict everything. It seems to me you were talking around that kind of an idea. Yeah, precisely. It's, uh -huh. well, it's just that you can't predict. It, it, the financial journalism is the art of, uh, it, it's the practice of attempting to predict the unpredictable. That's interesting. That's exactly and there's always, you and you have to remember yeah. also, and that's, it's true with investing as well, but don't forget always, in any per such prediction, there's a 50% chance that you'll be right. <laughs> yes. I have a That's I what makes it different from all other kinds of journalism, because you're not really predicting the outcome of, in political journalism, you're not necessarily predicting the outcome of elections. Right. Really. Okay, yeah. Whereas yeah. in journalism, if you're writing about a company or about the markets, there is, uh, there, there, there's, a, there's always the question of, yeah. you know, oh. are you positive or negative? Yeah. Not, uh, there was a cartoon, two guys going into the racetrack, right? Because mm -hmm. they... He, he said that it's like a crapshoot down on Wall Street. But anyway, mm -hmm. that's another thing. I mean, so much depends upon luck. And if you, if you hit it with lucky, they, the people who hit it wanted to think it's because they were such a great sage. You know, they're going to yeah. say it's because of my internal system of doing it and everything, but it's luck. A lot of it has to do with luck. We had two guys going into the racetrack, and one guy says to the other guy, Charlie, I hope to hell I break even today. I really mm. need the money which I always thought was kind of a funny joke. Right. But that's a kind of thing about the human condition in a certain, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a certain sense like that. But so you're not predicted, it's not able to be predicted, but you want to predict uh, your ideas of the way things are going. And where is it going from now? 1,300 points over a week or so. What the hell does that connote? And what do you think is going it to happen? It can connote other one of two things. It mm. can connote that the market is just simply giving out with some, you know, it's just simply blowing off some of its overvalued, uh, you know, just overvalued security. Now a the market is—it's is, is a correction. It's—it's—it's 
it's going to, you know, it's just going to recover from here on out. Or this could be the beginning of another bear market. You know, no. going, you know, with hindsight, yeah. we now know that 2000 was the beginning of a bear market. Mm -hmm. But if you can recall back to the year 2000, March 2000, when things started to really look bad, mm -hmm. people didn't really know at the time. That it was going to. Is be it going to be bad? Is it not going to be bad? You see, compare. You see a comparison here now, or to 2000, early 2000, as far as the dot com bubble. Well, it could be. You yeah. know, the question is this: Is but it? But this is on the. This is on the home. A uh, large part of it is on home mortgage yeah. paper. But in, 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 when it comes to the market, it doesn't really matter what's 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 causing this, because you know, two weeks from now, it's we could be easy. looking back at this and saying, well, you know, that subprime mortgage thing, it just sort of vanished, and then mm. we don't care anymore now. Yeah, Factor X is yeah. really dominating yeah. everything. We have profits, and all of a sudden, the market's rising. Yeah. You know? We had something Silverado or something, and there was something else that yeah. said that, yeah, okay, yeah, right, go ahead, sorry. So we don't know uh. whether this is 2000, which is the beginning of a big decline, or, or, or whether it's 1998, where you had a really significant decline, and then it just went back up again. But with all due respect, if this is right, set me straight, and I'm uh -huh. really ignorant here and everything, but if, there's, uh -huh. if this thing is the subprime that had to do with a lot of real estate stuff that affects uh -huh. the, I, I was saying, if, uh, residential, you know, the people, whereas the people that were invested eventually so in dot-com possibility startups and everything, that was a different class of people than the people who have everything poured into their basic residential home that could be under threat well, by it's this people thing. who borrowed. It's, going to, it's, yeah, it's, it's people. No, it, but it's, 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 it's a certain class of people. It's only going to hurt borrow, the investment class. It's not going to hurt the no. people who are going to lose their homes, that they can't people make aren't necessarily the gonna payments and so forth. And it's going to have political and sociological implications look, people, for nobody the forced, people nobody than forced, the class. Nobody forced the people who took out subprime loans to take out subprime loans. They entered into contracts, they took out subprime loans, and they can't afford to pay it. I don't feel actually a lot of sympathy for people who take out loans and can't pay them. Well, they were I, just I, poor folks no, trying to get poor, ahead, poor. no? No, they're not necessarily no, poor, poor citizens people. They're trying to get a school teacher or something. They're not something. necessarily they're poor folks. They're trying to get a home. They want a home where the kid can grow up and have, you know, and get it's a lot in of people, on... And it's also a lot of people who, who bought uh, houses that were just too big and that, uh, and therefore required, you know, sometimes uh, you, you, you were only eligible for, so you only could, had to buy a subprime loan if, if, you're, if the value of the house was too high. Perhaps you wanted to buy a house in Manhattan and not in Queens. Or you thought that decision well, was made by the consumer. And, well, and I don't think that consumer deserves any sympathy because he wanted to live in Manhattan. They didn't want to live in Queens. You don't think Queens. it's a different group of people. You're not going to no, get I don't. into a lot of school teachers, no, firemen, and things like that. Well, school teachers and firemen, uh, you, you, know, you, know, you know, just yeah. citizens. Nobody forces Re citizens. Nobody forces citizens to take out loans. Yeah, but that, are that, that they cannot afford to pay. All right, every, very good. They but can every rent day, if they don't want to pay. Everyday citizens are going to be invested in something in their life, and that's going to be a home. And that's a way that they have increased their net worth over decades and so forth. So they do. And then all of a sudden, you're going to be able to invest and buy the home, not pay the rent. Do that. You're going to take your, fruit, your money from your salary is going to be able to do it and so forth. And they invest in that. The people in the dot-com were investing in a business. It was a different class of people than a person investing in their home and hearth. And it's going to be taken away, like they took away the farms back in the 20s. And it's going to have different sociological well, groups b being affected negatively by no, that. I, I a lot of good uh, middle class people well, are going I, to be really I don't, burned. I don't think so. Because you don't? Okay. No, I don't Just think wondered. so. Because, no, I, I don't agree with that because okay, I think good. that the people who, people who... I hope not. No, no. Uh, not, I, I wouldn't. Middle so. or even lower class people. Well, lower class people can often, uh, you know, n wouldn't necessarily take out subprime loans. They might be eligible for, for uh, you know, first time home buyer uh, programs mm -hmm. and other things, which are out of the subprime. You know, genuine poor people aren't the ones who are taking out subprime loans. Mm -hmm. It was people who wanted to buy houses that were necessar not necessarily covered by Fannie Mae, uh -huh. uh, well, and therefore Freddie, had to get jumbo Freddie mortgages or yeah. Freddie Mac and all uh, these other yeah. uh, programs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the subprime lenders. You, you know, subprime lenders were lo were loaning to people. Uh, who who wanted to buy houses that were of a certain size and of a certain in value the uh, in, the, in wherever yeah. you know who decided not to rent who made who made not, who made decisions who made choices and their choices uh, are coming back to haunt them they may not necessarily be able to pay pay it back and it's not we're to, we're not talking by the way about foreclosures on massive number of people we're talking we're about we're talking about the about the the financial condition. Not talking about any particular technique, uh, any particular event that's causing foreclosures, such as in the Dust Belt of yeah. the 1930s. Job is back. Yeah, we're talking about the, the financial health of the lenders, not the financial health 
uh, a, a change in the financial health of the, uh, health of the lenders, not a change, a fundamental significant change in the financial health of the of, of the borrowers. Oh, the bar okay, that's good. what's really Thank that's you. what's I'm happy to hear well, that. That's what's really causing all, all right. this problem. Well, that's what's causing you, all of this. Yeah, I asked you earlier about REITs or uh, real estate investment. REITs. Uh, you know, it's like mutual fund of real estate and that kind of stuff. Yes. It's a, a, a mutual fund of real estate, and in real effect, estate yeah. has been something that a lot of people have seen has been a gold thing in order to be investing as far as the the people as opposed to let's say industry and so forth. And it's a good idea to own, you know, to own How a home. How much have you got vested in real estate? Uh, yeah. I mean, since I, you're, you're here. I should own a home, but I don't. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a renter, you know, as, as you can see from my, my, my compassion toward borrowers of, uh, uh. of loan. I should, but I don't. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I have some money in REITs, which have, I think I saw one down 20%. Yeah, I know. They, that, that's what I'm saying. That's very worrying to me that those are going down in a sense. Because I've got well, this uh, very simplistic view goes. that the that the, the home and hearth has been a way in which the poor folks have been able to get a little bit of a leg up into a capitalist system that's where you true. make money by investing in something that's going to be worth more in the future, that's whether that's a product really do, or a home. But that's got nothing really to do with the subprime lending crisis. Okay. Oh, okay. You know, this is not like, for example, the situation in the 1980s where farmers were unable to Bar pay. Eight, yeah. You know, were unable to pay back. In the 1980s, you had a situation. Or the 1920s. Or the 1920s. But even more recently than that, there were massive foreclosures on, on farms. Yeah. Uh, because of the, of, of the of the various bunch of things. But that's not what we're talking about. Sorry, optimistic. Yeah. Uh, we only got about a minute left, okay? Yeah. So we're down to haiku time. Uh -huh. Okay, you got to do it in haiku style. Oh, right? yeah. But the thing is, are you optimistic, pessimistic about the economic outlook as you talk here on on uh, August 17th of 2007? I am actually pretty pessimistic. But the reason I'm pessimistic is because the market sucks. Uh -huh. So, and I see my own portfolio down. Uh -huh. But you know, that's sometimes the best time to buy. <laughs> <laughs> so I say to myself, yeah. since I feel bad, I should maybe put some of my cash into, uh, you know, into, into, so, into, some, uh, into some stocks. Okay, you're on a lot of research now that you don't want to talk about. On another, on a non-financial non subject. On a non-financial subject, you don't want to even bring it up. Oh, I don't want to. But you're hard at it. You're hard at it. I'm hard at it. You're hard at it. You're working hard. Oh, you and bet. okay, that's good. Gary Weiss is a pleasure. Sorry, I brought up a lot of irrelevancies. So you're uh, from irrelevancies uh, are the spice of life. Yeah. Okay. But this is the book. Let's see. This is out in the bookstores now. This will be in the bookstores. It'll be in Barnes and Noble and so forth. It Wall is. Street versus America, and I can't read it. A yeah. What is Muckraking it? look at the thieves, fakers, and charlatans who are ripping you off. Uh, you heard it here, folks. And you can get this book at <laughs> Borders or any of uh, your friendly bookstore. Or you can find it on the internet and Amazon. reference to it. And th that's, a, that's a great title and so forth. And thanks a lot, Gary, for coming My in pleasure. And for reporting and bringing us up to date on understanding these situations. Mm -hmm. You know Lucy Commissar? Or the economic hitman guy? What's his name? Wrote that the sounds book? familiar. Yeah. Lucy Commissar is great in terms of... Uh, Exposing tax havens off oh, in the Cayman yes. Islands and that sort oh, of thing. Oh, also the that guy. Oh, yeah, you should have him on. You know, yeah, actually, the, the, the guy. Perkins. Perkins. No, the, the guy who was at the who's with the Times. What's his name again? Louis Anshel. No, Anshel? no, David uh, Johnston. David Johnston. I don't know. Oh yeah. Yeah. He well, wrote a put book. me in touch with some of these people. You know, just send me an email. But he wrote a book called uh, on the tax system, whose name I oh yes, he wrote a book on taxes, mm -hmm. on tax shelters. You like you like it's a Oprah. great book. Okay, Lucy Commissar is great oh. too. Yeah.